When Geraldine Page won the Best Actress Oscar in 1986 for The Trip to Bountiful, members of the audience jumped to their feet in applause. Such a standing ovation is rare, so what could merit such a reaction? For Page, the award was a long time coming. This was her eighth nomination, but her first win. Had she lost that night, she would have broken the record for the most acting nominations without winning, a record that now belongs to Peter O'Toole. Of course, the win was a relief, but like any year at the Oscars, no honor is guaranteed. Her category was filled to the brim with talent. The ever-present Meryl Streep had her usual fanfare, and a newcomer by the name of Whoopi Goldberg had Hollywood buzzing. Her standout performance led The Color Purple to 11 nominations, but despite the film's initial momentum, it went home empty-handed on Oscar night. In this video, we'll talk about why, why it took so long to recognize a screen legend, why Whoopi Goldberg may have been overlooked, and what happened to leave The Color Purple without an Oscar to its name. This is how F. Murray Abraham read off Geraldine Page's name when she won her Oscar. I consider this woman the greatest actress in the English language. The winner is Geraldine Page in a trip to Bonham. In most cases, such statements can be written off as hyperbole. In the case of Geraldine Page, the statement was somewhat of a profession-wide consensus. She began acting in her teens, gradually building up a lengthy resume in the Midwest before moving to New York in the 1940s. As a devotee of method acting and a student of the famed acting teachers Uta Hagen and Lee Strasberg, Page honed her craft to become, as Tennessee Williams put it, the most disciplined and dedicated of actresses. In 1952, she had her big break when she was cast in an off-Broadway production of his play, Summer and Smoke. Now, the film industry had its eye on Tennessee Williams. Not only was he one of the most successful contemporary dramatists, but also the film adaptation of his play, A Streetcar Named Desire, surfaced new movie stars, made a ton of money, and won some big awards. Working with him and doing it really well gave her the exposure to leap into film. The next year, she starred in Hondo opposite John Wayne, which marked the beginning of a long career of receiving praise, but not taking home the Oscar. Let's take a quick tour through the losses of Geraldine Page. 1953, Geraldine stars in Hondo as a simple pioneer wife. She is nominated for Best Supporting Actress and loses to Donna Reed, star of the year's most critical and popular hit, From Here to Eternity. 1961, Geraldine stars in Summer and Smoke as a repressed spinster heroine. She's nominated for Best Actress and loses to Sophia Loren in Two Women, the first actress to win for a foreign language picture. 1962, Geraldine stars in Sweet Bird of Youth as a fading movie queen and drug addict. She's nominated for Best Actress and loses to Joan Crawford's campaigning skills. O or Anne Bancroft. 1966, Geraldine stars in You're a Big Boy, taking a comedic turn as the smothering mother of a college student. She's nominated for Best Supporting Actress and loses to Sandy Dennis in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, the year's most nominated film. 1972, Geraldine stars in another comedic role in Pete and Tilly as a bitchy socialite. She's nominated for Best Supporting Actress and loses to Eileen Eckhart in Butterflies Are Free. 1978, Geraldine stars in Interiors as a gloomy, borrowed from Bergman wife of a rich philanderer. She's nominated for Best Actress and loses to Jane Fonda in Coming Home. I made a video about it. 1984, Geraldine stars in The Pope of Greenwich Village as a chain-smoking, foul-mouthed Irish widow. She loses Best Supporting Actress to Peggy Ashcroft in Passage to India. So you probably haven't seen many or any of these movies, but those short descriptions should make a couple of things clear. First, her roles display a remarkable range. There are the neurotic loose women of Tennessee Williams, but also repressed tragic women, and just as many comedies to boot. Second, the sheer number of her nominations suggested she held a certain clout within the acting community. Remember, nominations are determined by members of that profession. Actors nominate actors, and clearly, they respected her work. Third, that is an awful lot of attention for someone who doesn't really share the name recognition of other actors with the same number of nominations, which says a lot about the specific nature of her celebrity. As Edward Guthman pointed out in the San Francisco Examiner, Paige was unique. She'd never been a top box office draw, she'd never gotten that much public attention. Bob Thomas of the Associated Press added, despite obviously being a great actress, she lacked the element of glamour Hollywood usually likes to promote, but she relished that aspect of her career, saying, I'm not what you call a commercial actress. Even though the parts in the movie versions of Summer and Smoke and Sweet Bird were meaty roles, they weren't money makers, but I'd rather have people think I was a great actress than a bankable one. Her eighth nomination, of course, was for The Trip to Bountiful, which was adapted from the play in which Geraldine also starred in on Broadway. 
The story follows Carrie Watts, who plots to escape the isolated life she lives with her son and daughter-in-law in order to visit her childhood home in the small rural town of Bountiful, Texas. The reviews of her performance were, as usual, overwhelmingly positive and understood to be the culmination of her previous works. Vincent Camby of the New York Times wrote that Geraldine has never been in better form, nor in more firm control of that complex, delicate mechanism that makes her one of our finest actresses. Roger Fusto of The Courier noted, each of Paige's impassioned eccentrics is entirely different from the others. So her performance in The Trip to Bountiful typifies a career spent not in refining a single character, but in ceaselessly plumbing the emotional depths of a wide variety of women. Geraldine's long admired history propelled her into the Oscar race but it was a newcomer who would present the most potent challenge to her win in 1986. Whoopi Goldberg always wanted to be an actress too, but her road would be a little more sinuous. Born to Karen Johnson in 1955, Whoopi was raised in public housing. She dropped out of high school, got into drugs. As she began to seriously pursue acting, she drifted into improvisational comedy and worked odd jobs to stay afloat. One night, director Mike Nichols saw her perform her one-woman show at the Dance Theater Workshop in New York. Captivated, he approached her with an offer to transfer the show to Broadway. The show became a sensation in the New York theater scene, praised for her gallery of characters ranging from a six-year-old girl, a Jamaican immigrant, and a California surfer chick. Its success won her a Grammy for Best Comedy Recording and prompted HBO to record the show as a comedy special. In the meantime, she was reading Alice Walker's novel, The Color Purple, about a young woman named Celie who grows up in a sexually abusive household, only to be married off to another abusive man. Slowly, she learns to accept and love herself and leave the men who had destroyed her life. Moved by the novel, Whoopi wrote Walker a letter. And as it turned out, she'd already seen me. She'd seen my, my shows a couple of times and had already sent all my information down there. I just felt that, you know, if they were going to do anything, I'd like a shot at any part, you know, dirt on the floor, laughably or blind, whatever, whatever they had, screen door, you know. Little did she know that the stars were already aligning. Director Steven Spielberg loved the book too and wanted to adapt it into a movie. So she auditioned and won the role. Taking on Zeely was an enormous challenge. It was her first film with a demanding role led by a huge director, but she nailed it. Janet Maslin wrote that she grew into a tremendously compelling figure with a huge radiant smile that's even more powerful as her formidable scowl. Jean Siskel praised her as a natural talent. Roger Ebert took it even further and said she gave one of the most amazing debut performances in movie history. Naturally, she was quickly thrust into the best actress conversation. The press began to develop a narrative of this comedian who broke the mold, who diverged from her normal fare to deliver one of the most powerful dramatic performances of 1985. And that's true to a certain extent, but Whoopi never really saw herself that way. I plan to be known as Whoopi Goldberg, character actor, she said. I never really thought there was anything in me to do comedy. I started out as a straight actress. People keep telling me you're a stand-up, and I kept looking around and saying, I'm not really. If you watch her special, it is very funny, but you also clearly see suggestions of the depth she thoroughly explores in The Color Purple. As Frank Rich pointed out in the New York Times, Whoopi wants to make us laugh, cry, and think. So she was nominated alongside Geraldine for Best Actress, as well as Anne Bancroft in Agnes of God, Jessica Lange in Sweet Dreams, and Meryl Streep in Out of Africa. The major snub of the year? Cher, who had won Best Actress in Con for Mask. She wasn't happy about it, but she showed up in style and made a vow. Given everything that's happened, what are you feeling tonight? How do you feel about this? You know, uh, I'll be back. <laughs> Anne Bancroft had been nominated alongside Geraldine in 1962, when she eventually won for The Miracle Worker, and Joan Crawford showed up out of the kindness of her heart to accept the award on her behalf. Here, she plays the mother superior of a convent where a nun mysteriously becomes pregnant and kills her child. Her performance was lauded by the critics, but the film's overall reception was lukewarm and did not gather enough momentum to generate attention. Jessica Lange's portrayal of country singer Patsy Cline in Sweet Dreams won her her fourth Oscar nomination in three years. Yes, that math checks, because in 1983, she was nominated for Best Actress and Best Supporting Actress in the same year, ultimately taking home Best Supporting Actress for Tootsie. She solidified her place as an Academy darling, but with a recent win, it was less urgent for the Academy to once again reward her work. Meryl Streep won very recently too, in 1983 for Sophie's Choice, her second win in three years. 
In Out of Africa, she plays Karen Blixen, a Danish woman who moves to Africa with her new horrible husband, who she quickly ignores in favor of Robert Redford because honestly, who wouldn't? By this time, Meryl Streep already enjoyed the reputation of being the greatest actress of her generation and had been nominated for an Oscar nearly every year since 1979. Her nomination was a no-brainer because Out of Africa was the kind of Meryl Streep movie the Academy loved, a big budget, historical romantic drama in which she had some accent. Going into the Oscars, The Color Purple and Out of Africa led with 11 nominations each. Most people expected a tug of war that would result in a fairly even split, but... Out of Africa, the stately romantic story of a woman fighting for her dreams on the African continent was the big winner. Seven Oscars out of 11 nominations, among them Best Picture, Best Director, and Best Screenplay Adaptation. For The Color Purple, also with 11 nominations, it was a night of the blues, not one single win. Zero Oscars. Roger Ebert joined the industry-wide search for answers in an op-ed a few days later. He described an encounter with Quincy Jones, The Color Purple's co-producer and musical composer, had with the press when they asked him his thoughts on the matter. Resigned, Jones simply said, that's the way it is. Ebert wrote, I imagine he was making a quiet, almost dispassionate statement about a black film in a white society. Quincy's sentiments found a relatively strong echo. Three days before the publication of Ebert's article, a local LA chapter of the NAACP filed a letter of protest labeling the Academy Awards a slap in the face. A radio station in DC urged listeners to wear a purple ribbon in protest of the Academy's actions. The Academy, of course, contested the accusation of racial bias, citing the film's 11 nominations as evidence of its general acceptance by Academy members. And as a counterpoint, 1977's The Turning Point, which also received 11 nominations and zero wins. As with anything, there are multiple factors at play here but all point to the Academy's routine blindness toward people of color. Numbers are the most obvious metric. As we've discussed many times on this channel, the odds are not in your favor if you were anything other than white. Only one other black woman had won an Oscar prior to 1986, Hattie McDaniel in 1939 for Gone with the Wind. That's it. There were no examples to tell her a Best Actress win was possible. That wouldn't happen until 2002. There weren't any examples of black women-led ensembles winning a lot of Oscars either, or Latinas, or Asian women, nothing. The Color Purple was breaking ground. In contrast, as Ebert pointed out in that same article, Out of Africa represented the kind of formulaic familiarity that advantaged its candidacy. It was the reminder of an earlier, simpler time in Hollywood, when stately epics were cast with major stars and cloaked in literacy and respectability. The film starred Meryl Streep, the reigning queen of great Hollywood actresses, and Robert Redford, a modern leading man of mythic proportions. And then you have a film starring names that most of the Academy voters had never heard before. Whoopi Goldberg, Oprah Winfrey, Margaret Avery. The only name Academy voters would have recognized was Steven Spielberg, who was famously snubbed that evening. The speculation being that the man who made some of the biggest blockbuster hits of all time, including Jaws and Indiana Jones, was making his foray into serious filmmaking, and everyone who'd been chasing his success wasn't quite ready to crown him the king of that too. Lastly, there was a sense that the protests after the film's initial release had a substantial chilling effect. Prior to the Oscars, the Coalition Against Black Exploitation accused the color purple of perpetuating harmful stereotypes of black men as violent rapists. The Chicago Tribune noted that author James Baldwin accused the movie of mangling the poetic vision of Alice Walker's Pulitzer Prize-winning novel. Black feminist Michelle Wallace said that the movie smothered Walker's feminist message in a syrupy Disney-like sentimentality. Black author Ishmael Reed called the book a near criminal assault on black family life and heterosexual relationships. Questions of representation are complex and require a level of nuance that mainstream awards season conversations don't usually have. For white Academy voters, it would be a lot easier to cave and ignore issues they didn't really understand in an effort to avoid controversy. Of course, they did, to the point that it created another controversy. The Color Purple launched Whoopi into major stardom, and in some ways her fame was revolutionary. She gave women a kind of model that they'd never seen before. It makes my view look a lot better, you know, looking at somebody that I know that, you know, she's been on welfare and I've been on welfare too, so. You just get the vibes, you know. I'm here for you, if, you know, if, whatever I can do, she don't forget you. 
but Hollywood's overtly racist definition of what a leading lady should be has limited women of color since the beginning of cinema. Whoopi was no different. I don't think she's a romantic lead. Stephen Schiff is the film critic for Vanity Fair magazine. Uh, even though she can wear a blonde wig, she can't play a blonde. Even though she can, she can act the way a beautiful woman might act and walk the way a beautiful woman might, might walk, she can't really play a beautiful woman. She was aware of what she was facing, but she was exceptionally persistent, never letting preconceived notions dampen her ambitions. I never anticipated people calling me funny looking. I never anticipated my own kicking my ass after the color purple. Never anticipated people going, you sexual? Never occurred to me that I wasn't cute. Whoopi has since embarked on a career that unquestionably ranks her as a living legend. She is notoriously an EGOT, having finally won an Oscar in 1991 for Best Supporting Actress in Ghost, becoming the first black actress to win in 52 years. And now she's a voice at the Academy's table. She hosted the ceremony four times, famously donning incredible costumes, and currently serves as a governor on the Academy's board. But that night in 1986 belonged to Geraldine. Most critics predicted that she would win, calling her the sentimental favorite, and this created the bulk of her momentum. Still, the company that produced the trip to Bountiful, Island Pictures, was an unexpected advantage for Geraldine. Algene Harmitz reported in 1986, an Oscar for Best Picture could add up to $20 million to a movie's ticket sales. An Oscar for Best Actor or Actress could add at most about $4 million. Big studios want a big payoff, so they really want Best Picture. Smaller studios, like Island Pictures, found it more valuable to pursue the smaller payoff in the acting categories, so that's how they focused their award season strategies. Although she'd been acting for more than 40 years, Robert Blau wrote in the Chicago Tribune, in the last three months, Paige has attracted more public attention for her work than ever before. The trip to Bountiful opened in New York and LA during Christmas to meet its Academy requirements. Prior to the Oscars, it played in 70 additional theaters throughout the country and had less than $3 million in ticket sales. After the Oscars, it jumped to 200 extra theaters and earned an extra $1.5 to $2.5 million. Her credential also garnered a much larger asking price for the VHS rights. Island Pictures also pursued this strategy for William Hurt, who won Best Actor that year for Kiss of the Spider Woman. The strategy clearly paid off, but it wouldn't have packed as big a punch without the catharsis of knowing that a woman who had paradoxically captured everyone's attention, but not their acknowledgement, finally got to stand in front of her peers and receive the applause. Most people at least sympathize with this feeling. So it's nice to see something other than that at the Oscars, especially knowing in hindsight that Geraldine passed away the next year. This may be because it was eight times. It may be because it's Carrie Watts and not another role. We don't know what made it actually slide into my welcoming arms this way. But I know what made me get nominated. It's because I did a damn good job. And Carrie Watts. 